Hello, everybody. Thank you very much for coming uh, this morning to see the Game Loft presentation uh, of uh, Oregon Trail American Settlers, and more specifically, of Game Loft's trek from uh, pay to play to free to play. So, my name is Samir Lajili. I'm uh, the Vice President of Production for US and uh, Latin America at Game Loft. And uh, I'll tell you just a little word about Game Loft before we get to the real business. Uh, so, Game Loft is a leading world uh, publisher of. Um, and developer of mobile and social games. We've been making mobile games since 2001. Um, and we, today, we have a 5,000 people company. We, have, uh, we release about 50 to 100 games per year. All right, so um, we chose to use the Oregon Trail um, and the versions we've made of the Oregon Trail to illustrate our change in business model uh, as a company from pay to play to free to play. Uh, because it was our first, Oregon Trail American Settlers was our first successful, really successful mobile um, freemium game. So before I move forward, could I have an idea of how many people know about, know the Oregon Trail brand IP? Okay, so I can't see anything. I would, I'm going to assume it's 100%. <laughs> okay. So a few numbers before we move forward. Um, this is interesting. So July 2008 was the release of our first version of the Oregon Trail back in the wonderful days of Java and Brew. And uh, what's interesting about this graph, which shows the downloads over time, is this nice spike here, which is basically the release of the um, Freeman version of the Oregon Trail. This is, this is not revenue, this is downloads. However, revenue graph kind of looks similar to this. A few more numbers. Uh, so our total revenue, I can't reveal the exact information, but it's, it's in a million. We're pretty happy with what we've done. Um, the revenue per daily active users, our monetization is about six cents. Um, and our daily active users over monthly active users has been 20%. That's across Android, iOS, um, and around the world. If you look specifically at US numbers, I think we're probably a little higher. Okay, so how did we get there? Um, well, it all started back in the late 70s, where a company called Mech released a game called The Oregon, initially it was called The Oregon, which had educational purposes and which was basically uh, sold to different classrooms uh, to teach in history classes, to teach um, students about the history of the United States and the history of the Oregon Trail. 30 years later, um, Gameloft decided to release a version of the Oregon Trail um, on Java and Brew devices, so back in the days where you had Verizon, Sprint, all the big carriers had their own shops before the App Store came out. And it was a very successful release. Um, about nine months later, um, the App Store had just released, had just came out, and we released the Oregon Trail, the same version of the Oregon Trail, but for the iOS. Uh, we sold it at $6.99 back in the days where we could sell games at $6.99, and it was also pretty successful that year. It probably it remained in the top charts for a while. One year later, or about a year later after, uh, after that, a little less actually, um, we released a second version of the Oregon Trail called the Oregon Trail Gold Rush. This was a different trail, uh, but basically very similar type of gameplay, similar game, uh, pay to play, $4.99 on Java and Brew devices across 500 to 1,000 devices around the world. All right, so um, this is great, but we had one big problem when we started to take this IP, which was 30 years old. And uh, that problem was, how do you going, are we going to be able to connect to these nostalgic guys that used to play Oregon Trail, the new Oregon Trail, inside out, and they were remember, remembering the game very well? And these guys were basically students in the 80s, um, grown up, uh, maybe early 90s students as well. And uh, that's not where the problem stopped. The problem continued with, with the fact that we had to attract a whole new generation of players. Um, which were maybe their kids, maybe other casual gamers. Uh, and we had to make sure that these guys who are used to fast-paced games, uh, used to tablet games, uh, and basically used to games of the, uh, the, the 2000s, are going to be able to like a game that's 30 years old. So how did we do that? Well, the first thing we, we had to do and we did is try to identify those key elements um, that would not change across all the iterations that we would do of the Oregon Trail. 
So we, we had to really see what we call core values. We identified four of them um, that would really remain always present in every single version that we would do. Um, this is what the game looked like back on the Apple II back in 1982. And of course, the first core value, which is pretty obvious, is the Wild West. The environment through the design, through the art, um, it's always present in the game. This is a, a screenshot from the Java version that we did in 2008. And the family is, of course, the second most important core value in the game, um, where uh, Pa and Ma are always on screen, the wagon is always on screen, the kids are always there. Um, so it's a very, it's, it was very important to keep that across all iterations. The third one is what makes Oregon Trail fun. Um, this is uh, well, the trail itself. Basically, the point of the game was to get to Oregon, and throughout your traveling, you had all sorts of crazy things happening to you, preventing you from getting there. And uh, some things rather don't sound very funny, like uh, the century, but uh, uh, we had to make sure that, of course, through all our iterations, uh, this, is, uh, this is the iPhone version, and this is your, I think, original I Apple II version, it had to remain in the game. Finally, and this is an interesting one, um, humor. So we identified humor um, as a core value. However, we don't think that the original developers, a company called Mech that released the game originally, um, thought that we were going to make a game that's going to be very humoristic. But we, with a game that's 30 years old, that's been played by you know, millions of users out there, there is really a cultural phenomenon around the Oregon Trail. And uh, people were really um, enjoying the game, laughing about the game. And you know, when people make references to the game, everybody is having, remembers it this century or, or things that happen to you. So we decided to make sure that to incorporate humor in all our iterations of the game. And, uh, uh, and we try to make the game funny through graphics, dialogues, and various things. So this takes us to 2011. Uh, as we heard in the previous talks, the App Store, um, the iOS App Store, and the mobile gaming world had changed a little bit by then, and we are certainly starting to see less pay-to-play game, much more freemium game coming out. And we decided to make a first attempt at releasing the Oregon Trail um, in some sort of premium version. And the idea was to basically, seemed very simple, seemed that it was going to work perfectly, simply take our Oregon Trail game Add a nice little shop to it, um, you know, add some uh, payable wagons, pay ni nicer wheels, you can buy different things within the game. Um, and, um, well, people would buy it, and it would work very well. But the problem is that if you, we realized that it didn't do as well as we hoped it did, because from the foundation, we, did, we hadn't developed that version of the Oregon Trail, this iOS version, um, to have in-app purchases. Uh, and basically, it's very difficult to balance a game and to have an ending successful result when you start with something which doesn't have the foundation from in-app purchases. So it, it ended up being okay, but not a very successful product. So we decided it was time to release a real free-to-play version. However, what could we do? Should we keep the same gameplay, or should we do something different? Well, the family made it. We made it to Oregon. Um, and uh, we have to think about what's next, what type of gameplay, um, and what, makes perfect, what made perfect sense was to settle down. The family arrives there, settles down. Um, you have, uh, you know, it's, we decided to go in a city, build a tycoon type of game. Um, also, it was one of our first attempts to switching our business model. Um, so we inspired ourselves from the successful freemium games out there, and we saw that, the, that a lot of them were city builders. So that seemed to be the right way to, to go. We also used an energy system, which was quite popular to, and still is, to monetize rhythm the game. And we had to make sure that even though we had completely changed our uh, gameplay, or uh, changed it a lot, we keep our four core values that we had identified within that new gameplay. And so we did. The Wild West is, of course, the easiest part. It's always present through art and through different reminders through the game and dialogues and the way people, the tone of the discussions. The family, we made sure that even though it's a city builder, your wagon is always in the middle of your town. Um, the pa and ma was there. Uh, the kids are always running around. And the trail, this was a little bit more tricky. 
uh, even though building a town is a trail of its own, um, we decided to, have, to add some random events which occurred in the or or classic Oregon Trail to uh, really add that element of, whoa, it's tough to get there. So we added things like flooding or like buffalo walk into your town or something, uh, anything that could happen to you so you never know what's, uh, what's going to happen next. And this also gave us, a ways, gave us ways to monetize a little bit better. Uh, we gave three options to players when something like this happens. One is um, a very uh, safe option, which the player has to use real money to protect his town. Um, the second one is not as safe. He has to use in-game in currency. And the third one is just take my chance. What's interesting is that in some cases, even if, you, if you spend money, you realize that actually that um, event, which was bad, could actually turn into something positive out of it. So it be, be made, added a little bit of gambling within the gameplay. And finally, the humor. So the humor is, is definitely present in that version too, through, um, uh, through dialogues uh, and through you know, cute graphics and animations, um, which is actually uh, something that is at the core value of, of, uh, and the DNA of Gameloft itself. We, we're a company that since 2001 have been trying to make the best possible looking games on every single platforms that we worked on, even back in the days of black and white. Um, so uh, this is an example of how we go about make the decision process and the evolution of how the Oregon Trail graphic looked like. Uh, initially, we, we, we said to ourselves, okay, we have to go with very memorable characters, characters that are a little bit complex. People will definitely remember this game as being different than anything else they've seen. We tested it out and we realized it was a little bit too complex and people did not respond very well to a casual audience. Then we said, let's make it 100% casual. Small bodies, big heads, very cute guys, um, but it was too childish. So in the end, we went with something that I think uh, uh, looks very good. We went with, uh, and that has that ability to be very memorable, very sweet, very cute, uh, and I think this is one of the strong points of the game uh, today. So with our prior attempts at releasing um, freemium game, we discovered, which probably in this audience you, you know very well, but uh, we were discovering this, that, uh, well, in the pay-to-play world, when you, somebody pays 99 cents or six bucks to download a game, there is a big chance that, that that person will try to spend a little bit of time playing it. Because you paid, let's try it, and let's keep, keep on playing it. Now, if it's free, well, if it's not fun immediately, if there are too many things blocking you from enjoying yourself, you're going to quit. And this actually altered our design from the ground up. Initially, we thought traveling was one of the core values of the Oregon Trail, since they travel from, from place to place in the classic game. So in our city builder, we had originally designed it so that your town would actually be much smaller, uh, and you would be traveling to a lot of different places. You would be traveling to the hunting game, to the, mini, to the fishing mini game. You would be traveling to a saloon, a gold mining. Um, but two problems occurred. One, a lot of loading times. And these loading time tested very poorly in our focus groups. So people ended up saying the game was not as, as fun. Two, um, the emotional attachment to the town itself. If you're too much outside of your town in different places, uh, we realized that the, 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 the players were not at, you know, getting that emotional attachment that you want them to have with that main town so that they come back and they play every day. This is obviously something that I'm sure you all know in this audience that we had to adapt our process to and change development doesn't stop that release. And our team continues working on the game after release. So when you're making 100 games a year with you know, 5,000 developers out there, and they were used to, um, you used to have the chance of working eight months to a year on, on a production, and then could change to something else, and you have, now you're telling them, well, guys, now you're going to have to remain on the same game for much longer until it, you know, the sales stop. They're not very happy. So we had to revise our process a little bit and adapt to this. So the way we work is that um, the creation team remains on the game for a couple of months after release, um, but then this, this, the evolution is passed on to another team so that they can really switch to something else and have those, this thing that uh, have the chance to work on very different projects. Of course, the evolution was a trail of its own and we made a few mistakes. So, um, this was our first attempt to make a um, holiday Christmas DLC. 
And we said, okay, it's Christmas, perfect. Let's put some igloos and let's put some uh, uh, toy factories and uh, it's going to be fantastic. Our players are going to love it. Um, well, the players put them in their town and the town looked like this and our players looked like that. And <laughs> the reason our players looked like that is because uh, maybe we had forgotten one of the core values that we had discussed previously, the Wild West. Maybe igloos and, and uh, Christmas trees and toy factories don't belong in the Wild West. So um, people actually deleted things they put in their town, <laughs> deleted all these Christmas factories, and we rethought all our DLCs, and now we made sure that every single event DLC driven that we would do would match very well the Oregon Trail environment. This is an example of Independence Day, uh, which you know, looks very good in the Oregon Trail town and where our users were very happy. So at the core of, of Game Love DNA is really to make uh, fun, quality games that look visually appealing and that players love. Uh, one decision that we made, even though we switched to a freemium game, is to let our player play offline. Uh, that means they can play in the subway, they can play in planes, they can play in any uh, environment where they don't have connections. This is not done by all freemium companies because obviously if you do that, they can't purchase uh, in-app purchases while they're offline. And also, uh, you don't have access immediately to your metrics. You only have access to the metrics once they connect. But we felt uh, that it, since it's only concerning 1% of the player, this will bring um, uh, more fun to them. So Gameloft is a um, global company. We release games in 100 countries worldwide in 12 languages. Gameloft is uh, Oregon Trail, American Settlers was no exception. Uh, we try to re release it in 10 languages around the world. Obviously, one of the biggest problems with that IP is that it's, it's a very well known IP in, around, in, in the US and completely unknown elsewhere. So we had to work with our marketing channels and we had to really push the game and the brand to make it successful in other countries. 90% um, of our sales still come from the US, but we are, have been able to have some sales in various countries out there. So since the Oregon Trail American Settlers Game Loft has released 20 freemium games, and we learned a lot from that first adventure, that first trail with, with that game. Uh, today we have 80 million um, people that have downloaded these games in the past two years. Uh, and we're, keep, we're learning every day and we're adapting uh, ourselves every day to, uh, to the audience. All right, so I'll show you what the game looked like. This works. Uh, when it released in the Thank you very much. Boy, a bunch of hands went up all at once. <laughs> I won't forget you. I'm going to get him first, okay? Hi there. Um, you said your revenue per download is six cents after 30 days. Um, is there like a total revenue you have per download, or is that it? It's six, the revenue is six, ten, six cents per day, and that's the average over the last 30 days of the game. Okay, six cents. For daily per active day. users. For daily active, active users. User. Yeah. Okay. Pardon me. Thank you for the presentation. Just curious, when you went to free, what are your thoughts on having ads in your app versus going ad free for the free version? 
right? So we have, we have ads in, in this game and we have ads in our freemium game. Ads represent between 10 and 20% of our revenue, rather 10 and 20. Um, we believe ads are very important within, with, uh, as a money, uh, revenue driver. However, we try to make sure that the ads don't interfere with the quality and enjoyment of the, of the gameplay, so we position the ads in very careful environments and very specific parts of the game. Okay, part two, but not really. So when you, uh, when you release a new version, do you ever do a pre-release where you're, char you're only availing, a bit, blah, 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 making it available as a paid version initially and then roll out the free? Or what are your, what are your thoughts on that approach? No, we don't do that. We really have, we still do a lot of pay-to-play games at Gameloft. Our portfolio is maybe now half-half. Um, so a game is either free-to-play, pay-to-play, but in every pay-to-play games that we release, there's always a paid in-app purchases within the game. Can you talk a little bit about the cultural differences on the development teams between a premium game development team and a freemium game development team? Well, the development team, um, I mean, initially when we switched to, it's, it's interesting, when you switched to, um, from pay to play to free to play, you had a lot of the teams which were not very happy for, to make that switch. They felt, um, uh, wow, you're giving us, um, we, we're not a free to play company, why are we doing these free to play games, we want to remain pay to play. But um, in the end, and I think when you look now at the teams, you know, we've done this over the past two years, uh, the teams are pretty happy, whether they work on a free to play game and pay to play game. Um, and uh, there is no, no real cultural difference. Um, the only thing which really affects uh, the team's morale is how long they stay in the game after they create it. When you have creators, they want to create, and you don't want to, uh, at Game Love, we try to avoid having them staying on the same game over and over again. That's really the main thing that changed. Thanks for the speech. My question is, I know Oringo Chill is a very famous title, at the same time, I noticed actually this game linked to like Facebook and Twitter, such as this type of platform. Can you explain like how much uh, each like the famous title contribute to the user acquisition versus like the Facebook, this type of viral stuff? Uh, is the good job or not from this, uh, from like the viral perspective? So within uh, the Oregon Trail, you have access to Facebook and Twitter the Oregon Trail American Settlers. The original Oregon Trail, uh, even the premium version we've made, did, did not have um, Facebook or, or Twitter. Uh, did I understand the question right? I think I missed the first part. I think, if, if I might, I think what he was asking was how much the name itself, the name recognition of Oregon Trail contributed to customer acquisition versus other like viral or social forms of distribution. Oh, okay. Did I get that right? Yeah, well obviously when you have an IP and a name like the Oregon Trail, you obviously have initially a big, uh, you know, visibility is much bit better and the downloads are gonna be uh, coming much easily initially. Now, uh, once you, and this is, you know, what I say initially in this presentation, once you go uh, and have all these fans that were fans of the original game download your game, you still need to do a good job of communication and to attract these, these, these new gen next generation of gamers. Um, and yes, absolutely, we use, it. we use heavily Facebook, we use heavily, heavily Twitter, um, and we try to be as viral as possible within the game uh, to, uh, to attract new users. And uh, uh, I think this being our, our first attempt, our, uh, it's now much better, but at least the, the social aspect of the game was not fantastic. There was a lot of problems initially. Now it's, it's, it's much better. Uh, the social represents maybe 5% of, uh, you know, 5% of the players actually use social networks, so it's still very small. Got one more question, I think. Uh, do you know what percent of your users were familiar with the brand before they played the game? We don't know, we don't have that information. Do you have any idea? Um, I think that, um, out of the 11 million people that downloaded the game, I would say that's probably um, 60 to 70%. 60 to 70%. And, yeah. and, um, in terms of the demographics, are you looking at a lot of older generation introducing the brand to their kids? Or yes, what, what, absolutely. What, okay. That's a big part of it, yeah. That's pretty cool. I think that's it. Thank you very much for your time, Samir. Thank you very much.